So uh, today we have for our keynote speaker, Martin Schultz, uh, a professor and chair for computer architecture and parallel systems at uh, the Technical University of Munich. Um, I'll go ahead and let Martin start sharing while I, while I introduce him. Um, so many of you uh, probably already know Martin, uh, but he is, uh, he joined uh, the uh, Technical University of Munich in 2017. He is also a member of the board of directors at the Leibniz Supercomputer Center. Prior to that, he held positions at the Center for Applied Scientific Computing at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and Cornell University. Uh, he earned his doctorate in computer science in 2001 from the Technical University of Munich and a master in science in computer science from UIUC. Martin has published over 200 peer-reviewed papers and currently serves as the chair of the MPI Forum, the standardization body for the MPI or message passing interface. His research interests include parallel and distributed architectures and applications, performance modeling, modeling and analysis, memory system optimization, parallel programming paradigms, tool support for parallel programming, powerware, parallel computing, and fault tolerance at the application and system level. Martin was a recipient of the IEEE ACM Gordon Bell Award in 2006 and an R&D 100 Award in 2011. And today Martin will be speaking about the final steps to MPI 4.0 and what is next. So thank you for joining us, Martin. Um, you can go ahead and present your slides. We might have. Sorry, it looks like he got dropped down from the panelist list. Now, hopefully, you can present your slides, Martin. All right, can you hear me? Yes. I'm trying to share in my. I know it always works. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, uh, my, my my Macintosh decided, uh, my Mac decided that I needed to completely reset WebEx <laughs> to show something. Um, and it's still... Uh, we can see it now. Good. It doesn't allow me to put my camera on either, but I uh, will have to do it without the camera then. I think most of you know what it looked like. If not, there's a picture on the website. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, trying to get this cleaned up here. All right, so can you, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So thank you, Wesley, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the introduction, which I assume was, was very long since you still were talking when I got back on, so it was way too long in this case. But thank you very much. I appreciate the, um, the invitation and also the, the introduction. As Wesley said, my name is Martin Schultz. I am at TU Munich, but I'm also the current chair of the MPI Forum and is uh, in this role. I'm happy to present a little bit what's going on over the last year in the MPI forum and also um, basically going to us uh, MPI 4.0 and also what was coming up next. Of course, the future, the more we go in the future, the less this is, is based on what actually happened, but more on speculation and perhaps also a little bit on, on my own interest, but we can get in the discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, and as part of that, of course, since I'm presenting here for the MPI forum, um, this is, of course, for, um, with input from the entire MPI forums, so all this stuff is, is the MPI forum is a great group of people. A lot of put a lot of um, a lot of work into uh, into the MPI standard and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a large fun to work with. So thank you very much for everybody who has participated and who has, who, whose ideas I, um, I was able to integrate into this uh, state of MPI uh, keynote. For those of you who are just interested in MPI but are not familiar with the MPI forum itself, let me start a little bit about telling you about what the MPI forum is and, um, and kind of how it works. So the MPI forum is a standardization body for, for the message passing interface for MPI. And so this is where a group of people, all volunteers get together to talk about additions to the standard, new directions, corrections to the standard, and kind of help MPI um, to, to drive forward and also kind of address new needs and new, um, and new, new, new systems and so make sure that MPI stays this current. The MPI forum also oversees the correctness and the quality of the standards. So if there are problems, uh, we address them, we, we try to figure out what the right way to fix things is and we, we change the standard. And then also we represent, of course, MPI to the community through presentations like this, through organizations uh, like the Euro MPI conference, which is typically done by MPI forum 
um, members as well to both the supercomputing ISC and, and similar events. Uh, the uh, organization itself, organization is just very loosely. We are actually in the no formal organization, but the organization of the peer forum consists of uh, a few um, um, of, of a few people who kind of lead the effort. Um, currently, that's a, we have a chair, which is currently myself. We have a secretary, which is Wesley Bland. We have an, uh, an editor, which is Bill Grob, and a convener, which is Rich Graham. And then, of course, uh, most importantly, all the member organizations that, that we have and that and that help make up the forum and then help us drive that. And that's a very broad set of member organizations and covers users, covers compute centers, covers MPI implementers, covers hardware vendors to make sure we really have a broad spectrum in there to make sure MPI addresses the needs of today's systems and of, of future systems. And one of the big um, things about MPI, which differs to, to, to most other standards, there's a couple other ones out there which do it similarly, but most standards a little bit differently, uh, in the sense that we have an open membership model, which means there's no way to, to sign up to be a member, to um, pay a membership fee, and with that be, be, become anointed. Basically, is um, any organization is welcome to participate. Um, as soon as you participate, you become a member of the of the MPI forum, and um, you can help shape the fu future of MPI. Um, the, the the difference then is um, at some point when you with, with you, if you attend enough, um, then you become voting rights as well, and you become a voting member of the MPI forum. Then you can you can also then decide on, on the future of MPI. So it's based on participation, and so people that participate uh, get to get, get to help uh, formulate the next steps in MPI. Uh, the, uh, the MPI forum consists of working groups, uh, and I have them on, on the next slide, as well as the actual MPI forum, which is, which is a plenary. A lot of work gets done in the working groups to prepare for a new standard, to come up with new ideas, to, to, to flesh out ideas. And then there's the actual MPI forum, which is a plenary session that then actually um, ensures that it all fits together and then integrates in the standard and discusses the actual changes to the MPI standard. Uh, we meet typically, and this is getting a bit fuzzy now, we used to meet typically four times a year, three times we're in physically, three times we're in the US, one time it was your MPI and your MPI was in the, in the US, then one other meeting would be not in the US, either in Asia or in Europe. That of course has changed this year um, quite drastically. Um, we had to start doing meetings virtually, um, um, basically starting in, in the March timeframe like everybody else. So we actually had some long discussions on, on how to do this because the MPF forum rules were not set up for this. We actually had to change the rules. And so now there's actually an option to do these meetings uh, um, on, a, on a virtual basis. And so even the, the plenary sessions right now are virtually, for example, we meet next week. It was supposed to be in Austin as well with your MPI, but we're going to do this, this, this virtually now. It has some, has some drawbacks and some advantages, of course. The drawbacks is kind of sometimes harder to, to do particular new things or kind of longer discussions. But on the other hand, it gives also new organizations a, a chance to join, right? It's much easier to join um, a, a virtual meeting. So if you're interested in the MPI forum, but never had really the chance to travel on a regular basis to these meetings, now is a nice chance to, to, get, to get involved. Uh, the working groups are kind of different. They typically meet by phone anyway, so there's a very regular meeting cadence of most working groups of every week to every other week uh, to discuss specific topics until they're ready to bring it up in the, in, in the plenary. I already said that the uh, voting rights depend on attendance, so if you attend two of the last three meetings that are voting meetings, uh, then you're eligible to vote, uh, and with that can help the, the drive the standard. And voting means so to kind of approve an addition to the MPI uh, standard or, or reject it if you don't like it. So new items um, that we bring into the standard typically have a reading, so we actually read these things out loud. This is really helpful to kind of see how things fit, fit together. And then there's two votes to kind of make sure that people have enough time to, uh, to, to think about additions. And everything I talk about in the, uh, in the area of MPI 4 actually went through this process of a reading or multiple readings and the appropriate votes afterwards. As I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of working groups uh, that, that are assigned uh, by theme. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I listed the current active working groups here together with the, with the contact uh, people from these working groups, the chairs of these working groups. If you're interested in joining them, feel free uh, to, to contact them, to sign up for the appropriate um, uh, email list, which is all documented on the MPF forum website. The only one thing I wanted to point out 
is we had actually a name change and for a good reason. So we had a hybrid programming group which focused a lot on combining message passing and shared memory programming. And with the rise of the accelerators and the need to also integrate MPI closer with that, we actually added to the scope of this group. And so this group is kind of picking up steam again and is also going to talk about how to integrate GPU programming or other accelerator programming into the MPI and to see what kind of needs do we have to change the MPI standard here. So if you're interested in the topic, now is a good time to start with that. So what's the status of MPI? Um, the, 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 the longer, older story is we have identified MPI 3.0 quite a while ago in 2012, which the, um, was a, a new major version, which had also major new functionality. We had a minor updates and additions to MPI 3.1 in 2015. And then there was actually um, um, quite a gap since um, we don't have MPI 4 quite yet. Uh, this doesn't mean the MPI forms just uh, stood still. Uh, there's actually a lot of activity going on in the time and we're working towards um, additions and you can see in a second we added actually quite a bit to MPI 4.0. And this work is actually coming to an end. I know I was probably saying this last year already in the, in the, in the state of the MPI forum at the Euro MPI 2019. Uh, it took a little bit longer. We had a lot of discussions about very important tickets and uh, actually a lot of stuff happened in the last year. It was a very active year for the MPI forum. We had also more meetings than usual, more working group meetings. It was a very, very active participation, which was, was very exciting, but also a lot of work. But I think we're coming to an end. Um, we hopefully have the final discussions on MPI 4.0 at the MPI forum next week. And with that, hopefully generate a release candidate for, for the supercomputing conference timeframe, which we would then, we will, which we pull out over the MPI forum website. And then, of course, we're hoping for feedback. So this is a, a very important uh, point for the, uh, we hope the community will, will contribute back and will give us feedback on if there's any big things we can fix it at this point still. Uh, and if not, if, if, we, if we're all happy with that, we would actually work towards ratifying MPI 4.0 based on this release candidate status following that. Uh, the major additions for MPI 4.0, so it's a major version again, and this is also because we have some really major additions, and the list has gotten a bit longer since, since last time, which is which I think is, is very great. Um, some of the big things are we have finally solved, so we finally have a solution for the so-called big count problem. Um, if you want to have more than 32 bit of counts being put into an operation, we added persistent collectives, um, kind of analog to the, to the persistent point-to-point -point communication. Because particularly in collective operations, there's a lot of ways to optimize if you know that a particular operation is going to be done over and over. Uh, we added something called partition communication. I'll get to that in, in a second. Uh, we added solutions to be better prepared for these hierarchical systems that we have these days with the complex topologies and how you can adjust the communicator to that. Uh, we have the so-called MPS sessions concept. I probably imagine that most of you have heard of this by now, which in the current state gives you at least a new way to uh, uh, to do new initializations and to do better um, isolation and better better, uh, better instantiation of libraries. But long-term really will open up a whole, a whole new chapter on, on how we write MPI codes. Also that, I'll get to that in a little while, a little bit more. There's some additions to allow you better fault handling. Um, we don't have fault tolerance per se in the standard, but the fault handling will allow you at least to write some fault tolerance codes at this point. So I think that's, that's a really important step forward and the uh, Photons Working Group has done a lot of work to, to go through all the minute details to make sure these things are, are fixed the right way so we can actually enable at least fault tolerance solutions. There's a new tool interface um, in, um, available. We extended the MPIT interface, uh, which was based on a cumulative variable so far also to add events, which opens a whole set of, of, of new tools and then which may not sound like that big a deal on, on the outside, but it was a lot of discussion and a lot of work and really helps put the, put MPI on a, in like on a streamline the standard. If you work the terms chapter, and I get to that in a second as well, to clarify a lot of terms in the standard and hopefully make it much easier for users to follow uh, along with some of the concepts in, in MPI and also make sure they've matched to, the, to these new additions. So you see a lot of work went in and I'll go through each of these things in a little bit more detail now. But just to give you an overview, this will hopefully all be in MPI 4.0 and will hopefully have a release candidate ready for you within a few weeks. So these uh, major additions, so one is the so-called big count. As I, as I already um, um, uh, mentioned, the idea is to provide more than 32 bits for the uh, for the count arguments, in which we have in a lot of uh, calls, like just a point-to-point -point calls, the send-receive calls, but also many other calls. 
And these are current integers. And so this limits us to 32-bit data types um, because we cannot just change the, the type under the hood. Um, this also uh, causes them problems for some problems for some, some applications. There is, there is more and more applications out there that want to deal with large data volumes, that want to deal with large communication, large messages. And so we have heard this from the community quite a bit that there's an interest of getting this fixed and that we can do more than 32 bit of data types. Um, a while ago, there was a trick introduced into MPI that you could do larger data types. This was the functions with the underscore X. If you remember that, that did a trick for a subset of it, but it's no longer sufficient. And some of the other things like collectives didn't work as well. Uh, and some of some other things just made it cumbersome to program. And so there was a, uh, really a request from the community to, to fix the, this problem. This sounded very simple to start with, but of course, as soon as you get into the details, it's, it became uh, uh, it's almost a small nightmare. Uh, the idea, of course, initially was just to change the int to an MPI count and then define the MPI count depending on the platform. Uh, this breaks backwards compatibility, which is, of course, a, a big problem, and we didn't want to do that because we wanted the existing codes to still work. Um, not being able to do that, we played a lot with polymorphic bindings. This is also one of the reasons why it took so long for us to get the big count uh, resolved, because we were trying to do it through things like polymorphic bindings, uh, which worked in Fortran, but was a problem in C, C++, and didn't really work out at the end. And we didn't find a clean solution to do that without, um, particularly not between the C and C++ um, areas. And so we, we, we uh, decided at the end to go back to the approach that was initially at some point proposed on just duplicating the interface where we need these changes done. This is also not ideal that it introduces a lot of MPI functions to the standard, but it's the, it's the cleanest way. It's an explicit way to do that. Uh, for C, we duplicate the interfaces. In Fortran, we actually have the polymorphism that we can use. So in Fortran, you actually won't, uh, won't have to do that. Again, still not ideal, but at least uh, we did, um, from a lot of discussion we had, we decided this is the least pain for the users and also for the implementers. And so the, um, this, this required a whole bunch of, of changes into the, in the MPI standard. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a general rule um, chapter in the beginning um, that needed to be adjusted. There was a verification of all the bindings to make sure when we do these changes um, uh, that everything is still right. Uh, that led to a whole bunch of errata tickets that had to be addressed. So there was there was a whole bunch of work that, that followed on, on on this one. Uh, and then, of course, we added a lot of routines with these underscore C uh, suffixes in that there are these duplicated routines in, in the C part of the interface. And this is not as small as you may think. Um, oh, sorry, just for that. So we, we, we are close to getting this in. This is one of the major issues that's still being discussed next week. There were some minor fixes that that, that, that came up. Uh, we have to decide now how we deal with these fixes since this is already in the voting process. So this is a discussion for next week. And based on that, we'll also kind of, um, we'll, this will determine the, the, the final schedule for the MPI standard. So stay tuned after next week for some more information on that. But back to these routines, this sounds like it's just a few routines, right? But this is actually a big task. So in total, there were 133 functions affected by this um, that had to have these, these new underscore C functions that now had to be represented twice. Um, and so this, this is also one of the reasons why we hesitate in beginning to go down this route, but we still think it's the, the least evil at, uh, at the end. So how do, how do you do this? Um, there was actually um, a, a, a neat thing being introduced into the actual text of the MPI standard in the LaTeX sources. Um, we used to have LaTeX macros for all these, um, uh, for all these function bindings. And now they were actually changed um, by, by, by some, some great heroic off effort by a small group. And then of course, spanned out to all the working groups um, to replace everything with kind of an embedded Python. So you can describe now the function, you see this on the right side, this is taken from the standard document where you have an MPI send defined and you define the parameters with the appropriate types, which types are then come back to, to a small number of types that are known by the system. And from that, we, we, we generated the, the text again in a way that it actually did not change anything at all. So we just added the, the, the Pythonization. And then the, the, the trick was with, with just flipping a switch um, with the right parameters, we could add all these underscore C function in, in one pass. And with that, we, we kind of were at least somewhat sure that these things didn't, cha didn't have any, any weird changes to the standard because we could verify it before that and afterwards we just had that's, that, that's, that's a simple switch part. 
Um, so consequences, of course, is that you'll see if you look at the MPI4 draft that will come out uh, uh, for supercomputing, no matter what, you'll see a slightly different rendering. Uh, you see, but you also see more consistency between the bindings. Also, we uncovered some, some errors that the Debbie then could fix with, with some errata tickets. So overall, it led to much more consistency for the standard. So why do you think, as this is, you may ask yourself, why am I talking about this here? This is internal. This is how we generate the standard. It has actually a very nice side effect. And I think that's going to be very important going forward. It automatically makes every binding in the MPI standard machine readable. So we have now a description of every function with their parameters, with, the, with certain names, with certain names. Uh, in, in the standard, we can extract that. And so future uh, standard-wide changes that we need to do become much easier. Tool support becomes much easier. For example, you want to automatically generate tools from all functions that are present in the standard, verification tools that, that want to see uh, what, what are the semantics of or the, the exact um, syntax and semantics of some of these routines can be more automatically generated. So the fact that we have these now machine readable and can extract it for them, I think is going to be really cool going forward. And you'll see probably much more work being built on top of that, even though for now, the only thing you will see in the standard is a slightly different rendering. So the status of that is integrated in, into the LATIC source code. Um, so even without the big count being fully done, this part is done. Uh, and so if you, um, if you see a new version of the MPI standard, you see the slightly different rendering already. And um, you have we have now the option to 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 play with these bindings. So another big thing that came actually in fairly early into the MPI four standard is the idea of persistent collectives. Uh, the idea is basically similar to what we have with the persistent point to point. You one time set up your collective operation. You tell MPI all the arguments you want to pass, and then you get a request back. And when you're ready to execute that persistent collective, you just start this uh, this collective which of course has to be done on all participating MPI processes then. And then you can wait uh, on the completion or you can test for the, for, for the completion. And once this is done, you can reuse the request to restart the operation as often as you want. And so the idea is here that you will basically tell MPI, this is a collective operation I want to do over and over again. Uh, and so please start optimizing for it. These optimizations can take a lot of time, but if the library knows you will reuse the uh, potential in every iteration for long running code, and it's worth putting the, the optimization in. So this is a, um, a nice feature that's being added. Um, in the beginning, this will probably not be have such a high impact, but once MPI implementations catch up and start optimizing for that, we expect to see a huge benefit out of having these persistent collectors into that. Uh, these exist for all collective communication operations, as well as for the, uh, including the barriers. And so here there's always being added um, a, 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 a complementary set of routines that matches all the blocking and non-blocking operation also in the, in the persistent part. So again, why? I already mentioned some of this. So you have a repeated operation. You can specify the heart there. Then the MPI can actually lock down the resources it needs. It can actually create an execution plan. It makes sense to actually keep this execution plan and then execute these things behind the scenes on the fly and be, and be much more efficient to that. Uh, optimization uh, doesn't have to be done every single time. We can do this one time. We can even do this in the beginning at a hope, hopefully small, but at, importantly, a one time cost. And then you can do, um, uh, and then you can also do continuous optimization. So the IPI is written is in a way that MPI can actually behind the scenes continue optimizing for this whole thing. So this is already voted into the MPI standard. Uh, and, is, and, and, and will be available in the next version of the standard. So if you take actually look at the last draft from last supercomputing, that was already in there. Uh, one other thing that's relatively recent is the so-called concept of partition communication. Um, the idea here is this is also implemented for now as a persistent operation. So you set this up one time, it is a point-to-point -point operation, but instead of with the, uh, with the standard point-to-point -point operations, you actually set, there's a set buffer and you split the send buffer into many partitions. And then different actors can write these partitions and mark them as ready. If you have a sequential code, this, this, um, then you can at least do partial, say I'm done with this part, I'm done with this part and continue. Uh, but this becomes really powerful when you think about independent threads writing into a buffer because you don't have to uh, finish them um, in, in, the, in the right order. This also becomes very interesting when you talk about accelerators and triggering communication from, from an accelerator. Um, so these things um, are, are, are very 
uh, very powerful. This is just a very first implementation of that. Um, but the concept, I think, is, is very interesting and will certainly be expanded upon. So you have send buffers that you can split, and you can do the same thing with the receive buffers. You can split the receive buffer into partitions. You will get pieces of the message into these partitions. And once a partition is done, you can actually ask if that one partition is done without the whole communication being complete. And you can really reuse some of these disarriving data before your whole message is there. So you have partial data transfer. You can react quicker to messages without having to set up individual messages. You can have this uh, the, the, the handshake between the sender and the receiver done in a, in, a, in a much more flexible way. And then the big thing, the idea is that the notifications, both on the send side to say that something is ready to send, and on the receive side that you get when, a, when something arrives, are very lightweight. Um, there's not much going on. The, the hope is this can be only being done with like a flag or a doorbell or something very simple. And this could then be done from multiple threads or as I already said, from different accelerators. We don't have a full MPI implementation there. Um, so you could actually implement some of these parts in combination with, with accelerators uh, and, um, and, and, and with that set of commu uh, communication. So this is currently very simple point-to-point -point operations. We're already talking about extensions. So in your respective working group, there's a lot of talk about this. There will also be a discussion at the MPF forum next week uh, in the sense of what can you do uh, to prepare a communication. So now that you have this, 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 this lightweight trigger, but if you do it right, you want to make sure the other side is also ready to receive something so things can go really lightweight. So this may need some additional synchronization. If you're interested in that, join us for the forum next week, um, and we'll certainly have a very in-depth discussion on this there. The basic concept, though, is voted into MPF for zero. This will be a new chapter that's being integrated in the system because really a new type of communication. Uh, and right now, this chapter will be relatively small, but we expect to expand on that and expand the idea of the partition communication. Another big thing that was added um, also after some, some very intense discussions, um, but it's very important for current architecture, is, uh, is that most architectures, as you're aware of, are quite hierarchical. They are, um, they, we, we build up cores with, with their own cache hierarchies. We, we put them together into, into dice, into sockets, into NUMA nodes, and then into, in, into larger nodes. And if you want to get performance out of that, mapping your code to these different layers of the hierarchy becomes very, very important. Uh, and so you somehow need to know about the topologies. But of course, on the other hand, this can be very different from system to system. So you really have to be flexible here from the standard point of view to, to allow something like this. And so there's been a, actually a new working group that's been stood up during the MPI 4.0 time. There's a hardware topologies working group which deals explicitly with that issue. And they have uh, introduced two major changes to the standard. One is called the so-called guided mode, where you can use MPI com split type and a, a routine that we had already, but we can specify a, a type of how we want to split a communicator. And that we introduce a new split type for that. And then with an info key, you can actually specify at which level you want to split. Do you want to have each, each core separated in, in, a, in an MPI process? Do you want to each socket separated into an MPI process? Uh, and so you can actually play with the with the with the mapping of your of your communicators to the hardware uh, to, uh, to uh, topologies. You have to know the structure, of course. You have to know the names in your system. You have to know the levels, and then when if you if you know this, you can start optimizing with that. So this is great if you run on a particular system, but it's just not very good to run uh, portable codes. We don't know the structure ahead of time. We just want to understand the hierarchy. And this time with the second mode, the so-called unguided mode. Uh, so um, the unguided mode, which starts at the world communicator, and then you can start dividing it up and set you basically ask MPI, give me the next level down. And it will split out this in the next level. And then you can ask again, give me the next level down. And you can start splitting until you hit a leaf where only a single MPI process is mapped to a, to a, to a resource. And with that, you can write now codes that could work on any kind of hierarchical system, basically split down to the level that you needed in granularity and then use the communicator at that part. Um, what is still missing is a query function that allows us to, uh, to, to figure out which levels that we have. The reason for this is that we that this led to a lot of discussions and we weren't quite ready to standardize yet. Uh, it's very likely that something like this will come in the future versions of the MPI standard. The concept will stand, but um, you, you will, most likely get a function that allows you to actually ask which level exists uh, in a system. 
So also that minus the query function is voted into the MPI standard and will be in the next version. Another thing that you heard probably a lot about is the MPI sessions concept. Um, the basic scheme here is that instead of initializing um, all communication with MPI init, you would actually just initialize what we call a session. It's a local object. You get a handle to the, M to the MPI library locally. Then you can use this, this, this handle to ask for a set of processes that the runtime maintains. You can, you can see what's available on the system. Uh, you can then basically create a group from that. You can then slice and dice the group. And now you have a set of resources, a set of processes that you want to work with. Uh, and then you can create a communicator from that without requiring a com world. So you create a communicator. Now you have a communicator that is not uh, anchored in MPI com world. And it's only a subset of the process that you really want. So you don't need to uh, wire up everything. You potentially have some, some performance benefits. So this sounds relatively trivial in the beginning. Uh, but it has some really nice advantages. So for one, you don't have any implicit MPI com world anymore. If you only use this and don't use the existing MPI init, uh, you wouldn't have ever com world. Uh, you allow some runtime information to flow from the runtime into MPI by being able to query these sets. You can create communicators without parent communicators, which wasn't possible before either. And then uh, these sessions allow you to do some kind of resource um, um, isolation. So basically, you create a session and a second session next to it, and there's no sharing between these sessions as part of MPI state, at least as far as the user sees it. And so you can actually work with them right in independently. You can use this also for libraries now. Each library could, could, could have their own session. It doesn't have to ask anymore, has MPI been initialized? Uh, what is the main communicator? It can actually just create what it needs without having to worry about other pieces. And there's many more future uses, uh, and I'll get back to that a little bit later in the presentation as well. Uh, again, this is also voted into MPI 4.0 and will be in the next standard. Another thing I mentioned briefly already is improved error handling. Uh, the idea, as you know, was to avoid what's currently happening. If you have an error, MPI gets into an officially an into an undetermined state, and you don't know really what, what happens. And the, the, the typical thing was just to terminate the whole uh, application. Um, this can be changed. Now, this is now better clarified, better specified. Now you can actually use the error codes and the success or failure. You can limit this to only a, the individual operation. And so you can then basically just exclude certain operations. You can react to that and you can localize errors. Um, also, errors of uncertain things will not be raised anymore on com world, but will be raised on com self. Again, the idea of localization. And so you don't have to abort potentially anymore. And also the MPI library will now avoid such fatal errors. If you don't use errors of fatal, when, unless you say, I want MPI to fail, you can actually have um, uh, and, and other failure handlers now that allow you to localize these things and actually write some kind of um, fault tolerance applications that at least on a, on, on a subset. And this was mostly tickets that went through the standard and identified where this wasn't precise enough in the language and made sure that, that these things can be more localized and, um, and only affect a certain set of functions. This sounds, again, very trivial, but was a lot of work in making sure this is really done correctly across the standard. And I think this, 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 this will pay off really nicely. And so what you can do with this, you can actually do point-to-point -point communication in a socket-like error handling. So if you only do point-to-point -point and a point-to-point -point communication doesn't work anymore, and you have to write error handler installed, you can just not ignore that connection, potentially uh, to try it later on again. You can do master worker um, paradigms with, um, with that, or I probably should say manager worker paradigms with that, um, and also other types of application which don't need this, this, this really tight global handling. Uh, and a lot of enterprise applications actually come from this. Um, they were utilizing sockets for this behavior and can use MPI now to do so. And that was kind of an initial motivation to do that. And it builds the platform to build future MPI for tolerance extensions. So also this is an MPI 4.0. Um, another big thing that was added is the MPIT events in interface. If you're looking, if you look at the MPI standard as a tool developers, MPI had really two nice interfaces. One is the PMPI interface, which was there since day one, which allows you to intercept any routine, but as a drawback, doesn't give you internal state information. To compensate for that, we added MPI T and MPI 3.0, which gives you aggregate value variables to kind of 
get some internal state of MPI. Think about it as performance counters that you know from processes. Just apply to the um, the MPI library, and you, you, you can you can get to that. But what it's missing is uh, pinpointed event information, and that was not there before. And a lot of tools really need that, particular trace driven tools. And so there's now a new interface added to MPI that allows you to do that. It's built on the MPIT approach. It really nicely dovetails into the MPIT concept. So MPIT offers you variables. You can query which ones are there. You can do the same thing with events. You can query which events are there, and then you can basically install these, uh, these, these callbacks. There's no specific event types that are mandated, so an MPI doesn't have to offer anything. But of course, we hope these things are useful, and the bills more and more will be offered. The same thing that happened with MPIT variables there um, as well. And then also, uh, why this was a little bit trickier to do than variable, um, a variable is typically just a variable with some one single type. Events can get a lot of more information out, and so they need to somehow define the structure. And there's no mechanism in place to infer the structure at, 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 at runtime, so you can actually know what kind of event you're getting. You can react to this on the tool side. Um, so you can basically register callback functions now, so you, you find out uh, which events are available, and once you know an event is available, you can register a callback whenever that event happens you or in this case the tool would be called um, and then of course you, you could react to that and there's a whole bunch of uh, details now uh, to to avoid that we inf inf inflict certain problems on the mpi implementations there's the ability to defer in invocations if an mpi can't do anything right now um, there is some some um, some restrictions that can be put on callback functions to make sure they're not executed unsafe operations uh, and all these things can be queried. It's like it's this, this handshake between the MPI library and the tool, um, which is not trivial for the tool, but allows us to apply this interface without taking optimization options away from the MPI library and enable a lot of events in such a library. So also that is voted into MPI 4.0, and also that the first tools have been ported onto the top of this interface. So I think this will be also a very rich a set of things that we see coming up here in the future. And then, so these were kind of the big things that we have in MPI 4.0, and there's a whole bunch of smaller additions. Uh, there's a lot of assertions that we added that allow you to guide optimizations. For example, you can now state that you don't use wildcards, and MPI can then take this and, and optimize some of the, um, uh, the message matching. You can enable traffic optimization. Uh, and so this, is, this hopefully will give automations more and more chances to further optimize their, their performance. Um, we also did some, some work on removing the info key propagation for, for, uh, for, for communicator du duplication, which allows you better control. Um, we can also, um, there was a clarification on what it means to actually query an object. Uh, we deprecated song send cancel. There were some small fixes in the tools interface. Uh, and then also the um, one other consequence of having something like sessions or events. We needed info objects before initialization. So also that changed. So you can now use MPI info abstracts uh, at all times. So these are just as an overview. Um, so there's a lot of small things coming up as well. So if you're interested in one of these particular topics, please uh, please look out for them. Okay. Um, uh, so the, uh, the, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, we did an update on the terms chapter. Uh, so the terms chapter is something in the beginning of the standard that probably most of you who are users probably just skip over only, but it really lays the foundation of how the MPI standard is um, is, is founded and, and, and how some of these concepts are, um, are built up for that. And some of these new APIs really required us to, 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 to change some of that um, and also to kind of remove some misunderstandings. And it turns out as we attacked this, there was even a lot of misunderstandings within the MPI forums among the experts and it was a lot of discussions on that, and it took a long time to get this right. A lot of effort by a lot of people made this possible. But I think it really helped clean up uh, the standard. And as part of that, we actually started introducing types of operation uh, and what do they mean and how do they relate. And we were much more method, uh, it was, 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 was much more methodological to do this than what we had before. So it was the blocking operation. We, which, which does these four phases that we have to initialize something to start to complete and to free in one thing. The non-blocking operation would do two of these things, then the operation would be active. At this point, MPI would do the operation, and at some point that would be complete, and then you can free it. And if you go to persistent operation, you actually have this, 
uh, to have these four pieces to initialize something, to start it, to complete it, and then to free it, separate up in, into four phases. So I don't want to go too much into detail here. If you're interested in that, there's a really great paper uh, at the last MPI, uh, at the Euro MPI conference, also it's now in the standards, so please take a look at that. Uh, it really helps to understand some of the concepts behind the standard. I think it's really worth, um, worth reading and any feedback on that, of course, will be appreciated as well. So also that uh, is, is almost in the standard. It's up for second vote next week. Uh, we explicitly excluded the RMA chapter because it caused some side effects. So the RMA ch ch chapter currently doesn't do that. We didn't want to hold this up because of that. But we, we, we also thought it, we didn't want to rush it in the RMA not to get something wrong. So uh, it's explicitly stated the RMA chapter is, is excluded from that. But for the rest of the standard, it should be now much more consistent and much more easy to follow. And so some of these important updates for the term chapters, if you are um, interested in that, please take a look at us in, in more detail as well. So we, we, we kind of clarify the definition of non-local and local. Um, and then I'm not going to read the exact definition because then we would get into a much longer discussion. But if you're interested in that, please read it up. The important thing is that these two terms are now completely orthogonal. They were not before, and there was a perceived gap between the two. And now it's really clear you have a definition of non local, and then the same thing, and then whatever is not non local would be local, which sounds a little bit backwards, but that was the easiest way to define this. And we did something very similar for uh, blocking and non blocking. Uh, we actually redefined what non blocking means, uh, and we introduced the concept of incomplete procedure. Uh, whatever used to be calling non-blocking, so something that, that you have given up arguments, and these arguments have not been, been, been returned to you, is now an incomplete uh, procedure. And then the non-blocking procedure, if it's non-blocking and, and local. And so local based on these and this concept uh, up here. So if you have used these terms before and you lose them, particularly in papers when you write about them, I really encourage you to go look at the new definitions uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and take them up. And the other thing I want to point out again, we did the same thing for the non-blocking and blocking. Then blocking is now really a counterpart of the non-blocking procedure. And this is actually take, taken directly from the standard. And then one last thing, uh, which also sparked a lot of discussion, is the so-called table. Uh, there, there was the idea of to specify what um, the semantics of each routine is. And this is an enormous task and went to a lot of discussions. Uh, the, the intention was to, to put this into an appendix in the standard where for every single function you will see uh, what kind of properties it has, what kind of operation it is, whether it is collective or not, and what kind of special conditions apply. At the end, we were in a couple issues, not quite 100% sure what the right way to proceed is. So this will be moved into a site document um, that will be available most likely alongside with the MPI standard on the same timeline and will give you this information. It's an incredibly useful resource. So take a look at that. Um, and we, we, we're gonna iron out the last couple issues. And then once that's ready, probably the next standard, we will move it into the standard because it is really a useful resource to understand what the different semantics are of the different routines and to compare them really uh, one to one next to each other. So as part of the, the, the final steps to, to MPI 4.0, so the current plan of record is we will have to find the evaluations for this next week. Uh, we require a few no-no changes, uh, which means there's a couple of small fixes for individual tickets. Um, it's a de debate whether some of them are small enough for that. That will be discussed uh, next week, and that will kind of lead to the to the appropriate timeline. Uh, we'll declare um, uh, a release candidate if these things are successful, and then we will use this release candidate at the as the annual report that we will publish at Supercomputing. Uh, with that, we hope feedback from the wider community. Uh, we really want to want to hear if things worked out the way we intended, or if something really big got missed um, that we need to address before making the MPI 4.0 standard. So this will be kind of a draft copy of of the standard. Um, and then if everything goes well in the December forum, we want to do a validation and a first vote. So validation means we go through the standard and really make sure that everything got integrated correctly, and we would vote for it for the first time. And then if everything goes well, we would do the second vote in February and do then the final ratification in the February meeting of the MPF forum. So this is the current uh, plan of record. Of course, if something next week comes up that is bigger than we expected, the timeline may slip, so we'll, we'll let you know about this. 
uh, then of course as well. And um, but hopefully we can actually get this out and we'll have a really release candidate for the supercomputing time frame as we were initially hoping to do. Okay, so I see I was talking a little bit longer, but I think this this was um, this 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 was uh, hopefully helpful to kind of see what's in MPI four zero. So let me skip over the um, some of the, the future work a little bit more uh, more quickly and the more speculative work I will leave in the slides so we can take a look at that. I'm happy to chat with that over Slack as well, but I don't want to drag this out and I want to leave a little bit time for for questions and discussions as well. So the next steps will be um, one thing we talked about a lot in the MPI and the MPI forum is to do a cleanup pass. We did a lot of changes over time, larger changes, um, and some of the stuff just doesn't quite match anymore. I mean, there was a lot of effort, in particular, Bill Grob went over the whole standard and found out things that were missed and that we had to clean up, and we did a lot of cleanup of that. But there is still a lot of things to do in the terms, as already mentioned, for the one-sided communication to integrate this table I was talking about. Uh, there's a lot of things in, in terminology processes, as well as MPI processes is one big thing. The other thing is we added a, a sessions for the second time. We did this um, after some deliberation because we think we can delineate them, but there's an MPIT session, an MPI session. So we wanna make sure that this is clearly addressed in the standard. Uh, some of the binding changes from the Pythonization need to be done. We wanna do some chapter reorganization and other editorial changes. So nothing of this will change semantics, but it will hopefully increase the readability of the standard uh, quite a bit. Uh, I want to mention this is also a great opportunity for people coming in new into the MPI forum to participate and to help us out with that. A, a, new, fresh, a, set, a new set of fresh eyes would probably help us, uh, us pinpoint some of these things. So if you're interested in helping out with that, um, please join the MPI forum or contact me and, and we can certainly uh, put you in, in contact with the right people. And then there's going to be a, a couple of additions. We're going to think about, we're going to see some, some very, very trivial additions. Um, we're going to do um, probably add more routines to kind of do more orthogonal things like more non-blocking routines where we only had blocking routines, more persistent routines where we only had non-blocking and blocking routines uh, just to have to stand in, in a more orthogonal way and can be used by users because we always have to request, oh, this is only happens this way, but I want to do it the other way. And so I think this is going to be a push to kind of make this a more orthogonal, not really new concepts, but still it would grow the standard. Uh, the petition communication, as already mentioned, is going to be a big thing. Um, and there's plans to kind of uh, grow this um, to more complex gather gather operation, to petition collectives. Um, this may look trivial on paper, It'll probably not be trivial in the implementation of the specification, but the concept I think should, should, should apply in a, in, a, in a quite straightforward way. Um, there's a push to do more info keys. Um, so we, with the general idea that you can communicate application intent to the library, the library can start understanding what the, what the application wants to do instead of optimizing for it. Um, we talked about doing Fortran bindings for MPIT because we have more and more usage scenarios where applications actually want to use CVARs for communication with the MPI library. Um, and we always said this doesn't work because we don't have Fortran bindings because it was supposed to be only for tools. And then also, uh, the, I think we'll see some mandatory PVARs and CVARs come up for particular things in the MPI standards and in a very careful way. But I think this, this, this will certainly uh, have helped forward as well. And then, um, so then I wanted to go through a little bit more of um, a kind of a more, more future look and that I will rush a little bit through this um, because I want to leave some time for questions and I want to derail Wesley's schedule too much. Um, but one big thing that I expect to see, and also where a lot of projects are starting up, is that we see more and more adaptive uh, behavior, and MPI will have to adapt to this as well for better resource utilization, for better variability control, and to manage complex workflows. Uh, and so, and then also, of course, to, to address some of the new workflows and the new workloads like machine learning or artificial intelligence. So I think this requires some activity, and that requires some changes in MPI. Uh, as well. Uh, and I think the sessions will really help for that. The sessions allow you to kind of, um, first of all, set up localized operations on subsets. They give you already resource isolation. And if you then take the, uh, the, uh, the, the convex hull of all these resources that you have, you get an isolated, what we're now calling bubble. And in this bubble, you can basically do your, your standard MPI operation um, on, on the smaller scale. And if you don't need this anymore, you can get rid of the bubble 
and then um, start over with, with, with a new set of resources without touching the rest um, of, the, of the MPI. So this could be um, reworked with, without much global impact. Uh, and then you get this as a granularity for the malleability where you can have new bubbles that can be smaller or bigger or, or different components for that. The question, of course, how do you do that? The variability lies uh, in the process sets that the MPS session allows you to, uh, allows you to query. Um, this can be done dynamically. The question of where you hit this, uh, do you change the number of process sets, do you change the sets, or if you change communicators? And of course, uh, the lower you go, the more advantage for the user, it, uh, for a user who wants to be fine-grained, dynamic it is, but it's not harder for the implementation or for the description of what you want to do. Um, uh, the top one is a much more coarse grain, but even that's really hard on the implementation, but it's a coarse grain. But the question is, where do we find the right compromise? That's an active discussion in the MPI sessions working group. So if you're interested in that, please join us there. Um, and then, of course, sessions can be used for a whole bunch of things. Fault isolation is one thing, so it could be a nice thing to go to a better fault tolerance. Uh, it can support hybrid execution, if you're interested in that. Jean-Baptiste Besnard gave a wonderful talk at Euro MPI 19 uh, to, to cover this. You can also do better workflow support with that. Each, each bubble basically is a, is a component uh, that, you can, um, uh, that you can have, and you can have these bubbles that are independent and have independent components for these things. So I think there's a lot of stuff that we can do with that, and we'll see a lot of work come up. Whether it makes it in the MPI 4.1 or 5.0, we'll see, but I think a lot of future work will build on these scenarios. Um, another thing that we're working towards is an, a new tools interface, um, the, uh, what we call the cup dubbing the QMPI interface. Right now, PMPI, which is the current interface, allows you to do a single profiler. And you see more and more scenarios where you want more than just one, uh, one, one profiler. You want to have some system monitoring in that the, center, um, that the center enforces. You want to put some tuner in, which the runtime enforces. And you want to do some communication optimization, which may come from the application, and then still allow a user tool into that. So you're building these long, complex change of tools to really exploit this new set of, um, uh, of environments. And for that, we need a new interface which, which allows that. Um, that has different user or use cases in mind at the same time. QMPI is one option of that, as opposed to be language independent and develop this tool chain. If you're more interested in that, that's being developed in the tools working group right now. And some first information is available on this in a, in a, in a Euro MPI 19 talk by Bengisu Elis. So if you're interested in that, take a look at that as well. And the other thing what I mentioned, um, there's the idea is of separation of bindings. That's uh, something that's perhaps a little bit out there, but um, worth thinking about and a lot of people thinking in this direction. We have new user communities with, with new languages. Uh, C++, perhaps not that new. We used to have a C++ binding, which wasn't quite right, but there's more push towards that. Python, we hear a lot. Java is still of interest for, for, for some, some communities. And right now you have to do basically wrap them into, into C and use the C semantics of that. And that, of course, is not necessarily the, the right thing to do. And so one idea that, um, that is on the book to kind of pursue going forward and see where it leads is to split the standard into the semantics and, um, and the bindings. And so have a one that defines the, actually the semantics of MPI, define what a send does, a receive does, a broadcast does, and have operations and routines specified with that. But how they implement it in a particular language would then be left to the bindings. Uh, and so there would be one central semantics document, which would basically be the MPI standard, which would also be much leaner, which is nice. And then for each language, we could uh, develop a, a, a separate document that describes this mapping then. And so you could much more easily introduce a new language to that. You can actually decouple this from the standard and work on this separately by a different communi uh, community. So there's a lot of opportunity in that. It's of course not trivial to do that, but that's something we're, we're thinking about trying. Uh, and so this would of course make us think about more about the details of the semantics, and probably lead to a whole bunch of other changes in the standard and a lot of discussion, but I think it would be worthwhile because once we have nailed this down, I think uh, there's a lot of good, good, good things we, we can do with that. Uh, and then of course, um, what does this mean for scripted languages? How do you can kind of integrate in that? Um, that's a, that's an, another interesting aspect. Um, we, we, we can look into this, and the working group will certainly look into this. 
Okay, so you see there's a lot of um, um, effort going on, even though MPI 4.0 is done, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of good, good ideas on the table, many exciting avenues, and there will probably be much more. And there's, we're looking still for good ideas to, to, um, to introduce. Uh, we want to improve to support for classic HPC application, that's one avenue, but we also want to support new languages, new usage modes, new communities, and also support modern software design principles a little bit better. Um, some of the sessions idea of isolating things is, 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 one, is one example of that. So this, I think, um, could, could be quite exciting. So if you're interested in that, and please participate and, um, and join the MPA forum, help the discussions, help to drive the community forward. Um, said we have um, 4 zero mostly done. We still want feedback here. So if you have feedback on the MPA 4 standard or draft for that, please let us know. We're ramping up on MPI 4.1. But the focus on cleaning up the standards, set of, a set of fresh eyes is always welcome here, so please participate in that. And then MPI 5.0 is open for new ideas, and I just gave you a couple ones that, that are on the forefront of my mind. This is certainly not intended as a complete list, not as certainly not intended as the, the one and only direction. I think we're going to have many directions. It'll be very fascinating to see where we take MPI 5.0, and I'm really looking forward to having more ideas come into the, uh, into the MPI standard as well. So get involved. Um, there is a high-level comments list that you can send to, which reaches the whole MPI forum. If you want to participate in the working groups, there's email lists and phone meetings it's listed all on the MPI forum webpage. Each working group also has its own wiki you can get access to by contacting the, the respective working group chairs. And then join us in an MPI forum meeting. And I always said this a little bit in the last couple of talks I gave similar to this. With a little bit of, uh, with kind of in the back of mind, yes, you have to travel and you have to invest money. Well, currently, one of the few benefits of Corona, we actually are doing this all virtually. So we have these meetings virtually. Everybody can participate. You can see how our forum meeting works out. You can participate for a couple of times. And if you think it's worthwhile for you and your organization, hopefully once we go physical, uh, you can join us then physically as well. Um, but this has really changed the way we do business. And also, I think, opens up the community quite a bit. So I'm very excited to see where this takes us. So, if, so again, please participate. Take a look at the MPI Forum website. And also, if there's any more discussion, feel free to, to, um, to post on Slack or send me email directly, and I'm happy to chat more. And then um, I think we have a little bit of time left for questions, and uh, hopefully we can take some of those now, too. Thank you. So thank you very much, Martin. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, you can raise your hand in the um, the WebEx uh, participant list or send a message on Slack and I can um, unmute you. All right. Go ahead, Joachim. Go ahead, Joachim. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't have a question. Uh, oh, I, I, oh, I misunderstood the, the feedback. <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry about that. Oh, and apparently when I hit unmute, it actually unmutes people. So uh, I apologize. I'll give a little more heads up next time. <laughs> this is another fun surprise. That's what makes these meetings lively. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if anybody does have uh, questions, uh, Slack is a great place to uh, to continue those conversations. Um, feel free to ping Martin or anybody else in there. Um, Absolutely, please do. And sorry again for not being able to show my face. I would have loved to show my face during the talk, but some of my camera didn't participate. That's all right.